listen, baby. So what's happening, YouTube? Welcome to a John John TV. And on today's episode, we will be reacting to NBA TV's The Dream Team documentary. And for those of y'all that haven't seen part one, I'm going to go ahead and put it at the top right of the screen if you want to check that out. Video perform well. I'm going to do this series just like I did a courtship arrival series. I'm going to try to drop an episode every single day until we're done with the reaction. So this video, I say is about an hour and eight minutes long. I'm going to try to do 20, 30 minutes every sitting. Try to get this thing down to three parts for those of y'all that want to get it out the way or don't want to wait too long. So not going to waste too much more of your time. Like, comment, and subscribe. Let's go ahead and get into it. All right, let's go. A few days later, the team had a chance to acclimate themselves to playing on the same side. Chuck Daly had scheduled a scrimmage against a select group of college players, a group thrilled to be facing off against their idols. I found out today I might be picking up magic a little bit full court, so, uh, you know, things are just happening for me that really, really makes me happy. My whole thought process was don't embarrass yourself. Uh, and that, that was like the theme for me, like just hang in there. A lot of those people that I've looked up to, uh, Barkley, Malone, a lot of those people talk confidence. And uh, I think it's going to be a good matchup, you know, there's no advantage on either side. For the college players, it was a chance to see how they'd match up against the world's best. For Coach Daly, it was an opportunity to get his stars to grow into a single unit. I think we're somewhere between the mentality of an all-star game and trying to come together as a team. So we've got to continually work on this. Daly had been hired for his ability to manage personalities and egos. And when the scrimmage began, it became apparent that his players had left one of their biggest weapons, those egos, somewhere else. The non-fan would think, well, they're going to go in there and they're each going to want their own ball and Jordan's going to be hogging the ball and you know, Magic's going to be dribbling all over the place. Point of fact, it was the exact opposite. They overpassed. It was like, I don't want to start it off. You know, you do it. And before you realize it, the select team was beating us by 10. We didn't know how to play with each other. We didn't want to step on anybody's toes or hurt any egos. And so these young kids, they were killing us. We were not into it. And we I tell you what, man, it's, it's pretty interesting to think like you got really 11 of the greatest players to ever play the game. And they don't necessarily know how to be cohesive as a team because everybody is a star. And when you have so many stars linked together on one team, it's like, all right, well, who is our leader? Who's the real number one? Who's the true number one? Um, of course, you know, many people be like, oh, yeah, Michael Jordan at the time was the greatest player um, in the league. But I mean, it's unique to kind of see something like this that like they just didn't want to. They had so much respect and admiration for each other that they just didn't want to just, I guess, just take over or, you know, just demand the rock or, or anything like that, man. So it's, it's pretty unique given the talent level. Pay for it. Chris Webber was a man. I thought, boy, that's the guys come this league. I could get out of here. <laughs> Bobby Hurley was dominant. I did have some success penetrating and collapsing the defense. And our energy, our excitement to play, all those things played in our favor. Bobby Hurley didn't play two seasons in the NBA. Nevertheless, it did expose the one weakness they could have had which is defending against quick guards. They were playing great. Then I noticed that Michael Jordan is not playing. I'm saying something. Chuck, then he said, we're all right. Yeah, we're all right. Daly watched as his players failed to make up the deficit. And in their first taste of outside competition, the dream team lost. A story their coach didn't want the press to get their hands on. <laughs> I remember Chuck saying, as soon as the, the game ended and we were getting ready to let media in, it was erase the scoreboard. 
You got a team with 11 of the greatest players in the world, man, and they lost to some college amateurs. Now, hey, now, just to put things into perspective, um, I don't know if y'all was paying attention to, I guess, I mean, some of you might have seen this before, but they actually shown a picture of who all was on that college team. So you got Chris Webber. Chris Webber, to put things into perspective, was the best amateur athlete in the world, in all sports. All right. He was the best player coming out of high school. He led the Michigan Wolverines to back to back Final Fours, even though, you know, he had the infamous timeout call um, against uh, UNC. But needless to say, he is easily the number one prospect at that time in basketball. Bobby Hurley, you know, uh, Duke, they won a couple of championships because he was orchestrating the offense. He was the leader of the show. Grant Hill, Grant Hill later on is the next comparable to Michael Jordan. And that came out of his own mouth. You know, uh, Michael Jordan said two guys he's seen that could take over his, his role or whatever. It's the top dog in the league. One was Penny Hardaway. Second was Grant Hill. So um, that team, Jamal Mashburn. So that select team actually had a lot of players that would eventually become all-stars. Um, and they were very talented, well-led. But... You know, I think it was probably a little bit of, I guess, foul play uh, for Chuck Daly's part to prove a point because Larry Bird said, like, hey, Michael Jordan's sitting. Like, what's, what's going on here? So, anyway, let's go ahead and get back into the reaction. Saying, as soon as the, the game ended and we were getting ready to let media and it was a race to scoreboard. media comes in scores if not hundreds they can sense something you can feel the, the tension or the you feel something in the air well some of these college players we've just got through playing against probably should be on this team but uh, <laughs> uh, they'll get their chance the teams pose for a picture together both not sure what to make of what had just happened <laughs> but the man in charge may have had the answer He threw the game. You know, Chuck threw the game. If you look how much Jordan played and how he sub guys in, not picking up, not making any adjustments, he knew what he was doing. It was legit. It felt tremendous. You know, what we were doing that day, you know, they couldn't stop it. There are kids who believe in Santa Claus, too. <laughs> hey, man, it, it, it shout out to Bobby Hurley, man, by the way. Um, the Hurley family in general, man, are basketball geniuses. It's kind of like the Hurley family is comparable to, like, I guess the Van Gunnies, except um, or the Berries or even the Waltons. But the Hurleys, they actually had talented players that actually played college basketball in that family. And um, you look at UConn now, which, you know, this video is being recorded before the final championship game, UConn versus Purdue. But look at UConn. I mean, they're probably the best coach team in college basketball, back to back championship games. I think they're going to actually be Purdue in the uh, championship game tomorrow. And they are coached by Danny Hurley. So, you know, the Hurley family is to be respected because they live and breathe the game of basketball. So anyway, let's get back to the video. There are kids who believe in Santa Claus too and in the and the Easter Bunny and now that they've grown up, I hate to burst their bubble, but uh, uh, it was a game thrown. <laughs> Not many people would have done it. And he did it. Bro, hey, hey, that's savage though, man. That is so savage. Like, and then as we kind of talked about Chuck Daly in part one, man, one of his biggest strengths is his ability to manage personalities. And that is exactly what he did. He thrown a game to prove a point. Hey, you guys may be the greatest in the world, but you're not invincible. You're not unbeatable. 
look, a whole bunch of college kids just beat y'all. So, you know, that's that's a heck of a way to get a point through to your team. You know, now I'm pretty sure they had to listen to him after that. Like, hey, might want to listen to me because if you don't, that's going to be the outcome for some of these games. So, man, that's that's a clever way of thinking, man, <laughs> like intentionally like losing just to get through to to the players. So anyways, get back to it. It was gratifying to Chuck for us to get our butts beat like that because now we had to listen to him. From then on, he had a way of just saying, you know, you could lose. After fixing his collars and his hair, his speech was, anybody can get beat, so you got to be ready to play. And I think that's the only speech he ever gave us. The message got across. I mean, you know, Chuck couldn't have been happier, I'm sure. It was brilliant on Chuck's part to be able to <laughs> orchestrate that and play along like he didn't. Why didn't he tell you guys? We probably would have screwed it up. The next day, training camp ended with a rematch against the college kids. And once play started, everything made sense again. The tables were turned drastically. We showed them why, why we are who we are. We, we pretty much beat them by 100. <laughs> they couldn't score. <laughs> and by the way, Jordan played a lot more that next scrimmage. Yakum. <laughs> Before the dream team could play in the 1992 Olympics, they had to qualify. The place to do that was Portland, Oregon, and the Tournament of the Americas. It would be the public's first chance to see the NBA stars together in a game, especially Jordan, Bird, and Magic. Daly had asked all three to be team captains, but Jordan had turned him down. I knew how much it meant to both of those guys because they never had the opportunity to play on the Olympics. So I'd say, you know what, Chuck, don't worry about me. You know, let these old dogs do it. <laughs> Magic and Bird weren't just... Hey, man, it, that is like, Jordan is like a nice a-hole man <laughs> like like hey man i'm gonna decline being the captain but hey man let these old guys let these old geezers these these old folks go ahead and take over and be captains of the team it's their first it's their first olympus i, I mean dude this <laughs> this dude like he picked them up and put them down at the same time man it's kind of funny to see man i mean you know let these old dogs do it <laughs> Magic and Bird weren't just the team's oldest players. They were also the most revered. They had entered the league together in 1979, embarking on a rivalry that had redefined the NBA. And along the way, their personal admiration for one another had grown. Magic's just a great basketball player. He's the best I've ever seen, you know. I, unbelievable, I don't know what to say. In 1992, they'd be getting the chance to share the ball. But the opportunity would be coming at the end of their careers. Bird had given his soul to the game. But after so many years, his body was betraying him. I had back problems. It just gets to the point where you just couldn't play. I mean, you couldn't, couldn't think, couldn't move, uh, couldn't run. You know, if you can't feel your feet, it's hard to run. Larry was on the oh, fence wow. because of his back. So I said, man, LB, you got to play, man. You got to play. This is our last chance to be together. Magic would be able to convince his old friend to play. But at the start of the 1991-92 NBA season, he was forced to retire after learning he had the HIV virus. Doctors would eventually clear him to play in the Olympics, though that didn't stop fears from swirling. There's a lot of players that really didn't want him to play, didn't want to play with him or against him because nobody knew what disease meant. You know, they say you get a little blood on you, you got HIV, or you breathe on you, you know. Uh, I never bought any of that, you know. I just, you just keep going. And that's what Irving decided to do, just keep pushing, keep going. Six, five, three-pointer, yes! Oh, my! Magic had made a cameo in the 1992 All-Star Game and had focused his attention on the Olympics, hoping for an encore of a lifetime alongside his old rival. Our careers were really over, and it was something I thought 
needed to happen for both of us. Their debut would take place at Portland's Rose Garden, with their team needing to medal in the Tournament of the Americas to qualify for the Olympics. That seemed like a foregone conclusion to just about everyone, including their first opponents, who were completely in awe before the game even started. The Cuban team spontaneously like drops to its knees as if 12 popes had come by on Easter Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, the idea that this is merely a basketball game has been ripped asunder. It was a surreal feeling. Bro, just imagine that, man. Like, <laughs> like, hey, man, we're, we're in competition with each other, man, and then you're giving me, like, handshakes and hugs and and you're just showing admiration for me. Like, like just look at Jordan in the screenshot right here. <laughs> like, Jordan was like, no, nobody that's visible from Team USA is like, is like happy, have a smile on their face. Like, <laughs> they just like locked in, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> they're not going for it. They're not falling for the admiration because hey, as much as respect as you have for me, I know you want to take my head off. You want to beat me. It's competition at the end of the day, man. So, I mean, just imagine being in those guys' shoes, man, and, and you go – and they just showing you love like that. Are you about to probably blow them out most likely, man? So it's, it's kind of funny, man, to see that. It's been ripped asunder. It was a surreal feeling. She's like, dude, we, we're here to kick y'all behind. And <laughs> they want to take pictures with you. Then the game begins. Magic and Larry come out together. Two guys that had saved the league. They wouldn't even be playing this game without those two. And Magic passed the ball. Larry makes the first basket. Forward banking in, goes to the fadeaway. I mean, you know, it just, it just didn't get any better than that. The U.S. was off and running, and the result was a thing of beauty. Johnson leading the break. Five and no one seemed more excited to be sharing the court than the co-captains. Yeah, I come. Opening night was a smashing success, with the outcome never in doubt. Oh, a bullet from Magic to Portland. And late in the game, the fans in Portland decided they wanted a curtain call from a three-time MVP. The crowd start cheering. Larry, Larry, Larry. And as he'd done so many other times in his career, Larry Bird rose to the occasion. Jordan with the behind the back save. Here's Bird. Yeah, I come. He just knew that Larry Bird was not going to miss that shot. It was a virtually flawless performance. The final margin of victory was 77 points. And Magic. Whoa, and hold up. Wait, 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 wait. What was the margin of victory again? Did this dude just say they won by 77 points? The final margin of victory was 77 points. Oh, my goodness. And Magic and Bird had led the way. That's a lot of and points. <laughs> after a year out of the game, the victory had a special kind of meaning. Living with HIV, never even thinking that I would ever have a chance to play basketball again, and then basketball for the uh, United States. It was therapy for me, and I needed that in the worst way. And then there was the matter of making sure Michael Jordan knew he was back as well. Yeah, you hear what the captain said? The captain said, sit down. Sit down. Oh, this boat is going to sink. <laughs> that's right. Have a seat because you're going to fall. That's and the captain. That's the whole That's going to happen. That's the seniority right there. And I know it. Sit With Magic sit and Michael, there was that little extra something <laughs> there, you know, <laughs> and the, something kind of to prove to each other. I took it upon myself to always shoot with Michael. Okay, MJ, free throws today. Who's the first one to 50? Or we had little games, who, who was the better shooter? Know what you gotta do. Know what you gotta do. Iron sharpens iron. That control of the 
80s, in a sense, even though we were going into the 90s. Don't touch the phone. Please. One hand, don't touch it. Uh. <laughs> don't touch it. You know, he just come off missing a whole year. So it was who can win, who's gonna have the bragging rights by the end of this trip. You can't get too close to Michael, it's a foul. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't committed a foul in almost a year and a half, man. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's always tried to let people know that he's the top dog in, in whatever. That's just his competitive mode. I'm the young guy with the old, uh, elder <laughs> statesman. These the old guys. They got all the rights. They can't stand in one spot too long. <laughs> He's a young puppy. I'm the big dog here. Whatever I say goes. <laughs> While the winner of Magic and Michael's Can You Top This Challenge remained in doubt, when it came to facing the competition in the Tournament of the Americas, the team stood united. When we took the court in Portland, which, you know, we're on home ground, we wanted to showcase to the fans who will be representing them. The lead is 30. Steel. Jordan. Jordan. I'm going to send a message around the world today that y'all can give it up. You foreigners can give it up. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, and with that being said from Charles Barkley, man, shout out to the Philippines, man. I'm about to sound off the horn. Shout out. <laughs> Yeah, shout out to the Philippines, man. Um, behind the United States, that's probably the country where I got the most support from. Um, looking at my analytics, and um, it is greatly appreciated. And it's also impressive that my content actually makes it all the way across the globe, man, and, and that people actually enjoy it and and subscribe and, and comment and show love. So shout out to the Philippines, man, or anybody in the world per se, man. But thank y'all. Anyway, let's get back to the video. I can give it up. You foreigners can give it up. Mullet with a steal. Stockton has Mullet. Goes the other way. Stockton set him up perfectly. The Americans won their six games at the tournament by an average of 50 points. All right, Larry, um, your impressions of tonight's game. <laughs> the gold medal was no surprise. But what was unexpected was the team's interactions with their opponents, who showered them with adulation before, after, and even during games. <laughs> Patrick Johnson and Oranga shaking hands after the shot. The Tournament of the Americas had served its purpose. The US had qualified for the Barcelona Games and given the world its first glimpse of what was coming later that summer. I want to say this is just a small step to what our goal really is, to get to Barcelona, win the gold medal, and bring it back where it's supposed to be. Thank you. On July 18th, 1992, with the Barcelona Olympics a week away, the U.S. men's basketball team headed overseas. Straight back into the left, drive the room, follow our they would hold several days of practice in Monte Carlo and play one more tune-up before heading to the Olympics. The luxurious setting on the Mediterranean Sea was fitting for what already may have been the world's most famous team. Monte Carlo is one of those glamorous cities, and here we were with... And, and if you haven't noticed already, I'm not really doing a lot of talking in this video because this is an educational video for me. I actually... I haven't seen this documentary, at least I don't think I've seen it in its entirety. I did see a portion, I believe, um, of the of the, the scrimmage um, and not the collegiate scrimmage, but I think they have a scrimmage where they play against each other. And, um, and I think that's later in this documentary, if I'm not mistaken. But um, I'm going to try my best just to kind of soak in the information and, and roll through the documentary and see how far we could get. Like I said. The goal is three parts. We get in three parts, we're golden. So I actually start working on monetized content. <laughs> but anyway, let's get back to the video. The most glamorous team ever. So was glamorous cities. And here we were with the most glamorous team ever. So it's kind of a rock star-ish kind of a thing. The players were relaxed and confident. 
and willing to admit there was more to the trip than just basketball. I don't worry about playing basketball. That comes natural. I just want to have fun. David Robinson, Pat Muir, Michael Jordan. This is like spring break in the ghetto. <laughs> the opulent resort town was a playground waiting to Man, be Man, Chuck explored. is hilarious. The opulent resort town was a playground waiting to be explored. And the players weren't shy about enjoying themselves. Are y'all filming me? Now look, the scene in Monte Carlo was great. It was just breathtaking. I was down on the beach just kind of trying to enjoy some of the scenery. <laughs> <laughs> Paradise. I think every team in the NBA should train here, actually. <laughs> they need to get a team here. <laughs> every day we got back to practice, we made a beeline to the swimming pool, because all those girls were laying out topless. I'm going to be in that pool so much in the next two days. I don't think I'm on the swimming team in Barcelona. <laughs> We're all out there with our significant others, and all these women walking around topless coming, can I have an autograph? <laughs> so I signed it, and Michael, Pops me in town and see. Usually you tell everybody no, but because this, this lady is coming over <laughs> top, you're gonna sign her autograph. My wife looking at me like, oh, in front of the wife, oh, <laughs> hey man, savage. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's so savage. Hey man, but Patrick, you did the right thing, my friend. Because let's just say somebody run up to me, pretty lady, right? You know. Hey John, I love your stuff. Love your videos. Can't get an autograph. You got to oblige. You got to you got to show appreciation to the to the one that supports you. You know what I'm saying? If she just so happened to be topless, I'm not upset at that. I'm just saying I'm I can't I can't knock nobody for that. So anyway, Patrick did the right thing, in my opinion, my humble opinion. But let's get back to it. The best part about it was Patrick Ewan buying the beer at the pool. You know, seven dollars beer. I never heard of that. Of course, Patrick didn't drink. He didn't know how much beer was. One thing you don't want to do is drink beer with Larry Bird. And Larry Bird drinks Budweiser, which Budweiser is the strongest beer in the world. <laughs> and my head hurt for like two days. They were used to being opponents, but Monte Carlo was proving to be the perfect place to find common ground. I got the coach. That means we get to go first. Michael Jordan enjoys his golf, uh, as did Chuck Daly. I got the coach with me, man. I got caught blunt, you know what I mean? Michael and Chuck played almost every single day, if not every day. Come off the hill. That may be green, Chuck. Chuck was playing his practice schedule around our golf town. That, to me, was ideal. Yeah. Play a little bit of basketball, play a little golf, and you're in Monte Carlo. Yeah, it sounds like a basketball. <laughs> Relationship that a head coach has with his main guy is incredibly important. Chuck's ability to get Michael is amazing because think of how bitter enemies they had to be. Chuck devised the defense that drove Jordan out of his mind. And yet, here they are playing golf together. Jordan could really have unbelievably bad feelings towards Chuck. Chuck understood that and he embraced them. I'm not gonna lie, man. Like like I said, um, in the courtship of rivals series, it takes a man to compromise. Shout out to them two, man. Shout out to them two for actually being able to put their differences to the side. Competition is good, man. Whenever we're opponents, it's okay for me not to like you. It's okay for me between the lines. To want to take your head off. It's okay. But whenever we're off the court, whenever we're not in competition, or in this case, whenever we are teammates, whenever we are family, a brotherhood, all that stuff don't matter no more. So shout out to them, man, for being able to compromise and, and just forget about all that stuff because the Bulls versus Pistons, that was a tough rivalry. It was physical, bloody, painful. In order for them to just forget about all that. So, hey, Mike and Isaiah, you know, they, they might not be able to ever move past that, but it's good to see Chuck Daly and Michael Jordan could actually play golf together with all things considered that they just two years, well, a year, 
from that point hated each other. <laughs> so anyway, let's get back to the video, man. It's, it's interesting. I love competition, and that's the beautiful thing about sports. And he embraced them. So, yeah. I mean, I got to give you that. Huh? I mean, I got to give you that. A lot. A lot. I do. Well, you shoot 72. I watched yeah, that. That was a bonding thing for me and Chuck. Come on. Always been a thing that I treasure just as much as being a part of the team. Ooh, I love. For Jordan, golf was only one part of the whirlwind schedule, which his teammates were discovering was just the way he liked it. What are you doing today, M. Drive? You sleep? I remember thinking that. Does this guy ever sleep? <laughs> no. 36 holes. I'm playing it tomorrow, too. He would do more things and be ready to practice and play as much as anybody. Oh, Michael Jordan. The thing that I remember the most was going out and playing golf with Michael Jordan before a game. And I thought, and I'm going to be exhausted tonight. <laughs> and Michael just had ridiculous energy and was phenomenal. I felt like I was running in quicksand a little bit. And so, you know, it gave me a whole nother level of respect for kind of the freak of nature that he really is. Grab that plate of food, Jim. We played cards in Magic Room to five o'clock in the morning pretty much every night. It was so much fun. All right, homie? Yeah, yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> was like a bionic guy, or he'd play cards, play golf, play basketball. Jordan, going all the way. I don't know when he ever slept. Finally, after a ball game, he was just lying down. And I looked at him, I said, I think that's the first time he's gone to sleep <laughs> on the whole trip. After a few days in Monte Carlo, the players returned to the court for an exhibition against the French national team. See where we at with it. I'm going to try to give it a couple more minutes um, until we go ahead and wrap up the video. So let's give uh, a couple more minutes. Everybody had their eyes on one team. You could feel that it was just such talent and such incredible skill, and it was just such a pleasure to watch. The Americans won the game easily, even if their performance was far short of seamless. It wasn't a great game. A lot of sloppy passing. I didn't like any of it. It was a terrible game, and U.S. looked half interested. And so Chuck, kind of the next morning in Monte Carlo, even though everybody was a little hungover and tired, had to really kick their butt. Chuck says, okay, this is what's going to happen. We're going to play it like a real game. We're going to play. Hey, I've seen this part before. Um... Can't recall where, can't recall if it was like ESPN or, or something like that, but I've seen this part before. This this is a scrimmage I referred to earlier. So um, let's go ahead, you know, we're going to include this part in this episode right here. Four quarters. We had me, Scotty, Mullins, Bird, and Patrick, and Magic had his five. We weren't going to change that team at no point in time. You got your five, I got my five. We gave them the college guy. You can have Christian. Like, <laughs> we don't want him. You can have him. He's just over there waiting to tag in. But it was it was about, about pride. And the college kid couldn't help either one of the team. Michael <laughs> Jordan called Clyde out and went at him. Tell him, this is what I'm going to do to you. Fall away jumper. Good. What did I tell you? So I said, no, Clyde, you better get him back. You better, you better get, get him get back. back. <laughs> Charles Barkley said, I want to take Carl Malone now. So Charles gets it, all the way jumper. Good. I said, oh, oh Carl, you got to get him back. You better you go better down get there and back. get him back. <laughs> Carl went right at him, jump shot. You ain't nothing. You ain't nothing, Barkley. So then I came down. <laughs> 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 Hey, man, I seen this part. I love that part. Hey, I got to run that back. I'm sorry, bro. Hey, bro. <laughs> hey, man, shout out to Magic. <laughs> man, let's run that back, bro. I'm sorry, man. Hey, that's a joker in me, bro. I love that part. <laughs> Jump shot. You ain't nothing. You ain't nothing, Barkley. So then I came down. <laughs> <laughs> 
his energy is real. Dude, I, I can't believe I've never seen this whole documentary before, man. It's funny, bro. <laughs> <laughs> His energy is real high. He feels like he's in an opportunity to prove himself. And showcase that, hey, look, I'm still Magic Johnson. We st I still dominate this game. That's all right. That's all right. Here we go. <laughs> we go from here. Magic was saying, you ain't the guy, and you got other players in this in this gym. Come on, they go. All day, don't be cheating. Don't be cheating on me. It doesn't take much to get Michael going. Just a little something to tweak him, and it's on. Ooh. I like to lose. Mike always got that look. When you see that look, then you know just get him the damn ball and get out the way. <laughs> as much as it was five on five, you could see in Monte Carlo that it was gravitating towards, okay, Michael and Magic. Magic was hesitant to surrender his place on the mountaintop. And Michael being Michael, he needed to say, no, I'm on the top of the mountain now. Bank shot three. <laughs> saying, look, NBA's not yours yet. You know, I'm still here. Michael's like, no, it's over. This is, this is mine. And the funny thing was Larry was, he was sitting on his side going, it's his. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck realized the competition aspect was getting a little bit too high. Everybody on our squad. He wanted to end practice, but Magic didn't want to end because he wanted to keep playing because we just kicked his ass. <laughs> How you like that ass kick when we gave you oh, up? No, no, no. Come on now. Well, Y'all got the first, first quarter of practice now. Yeah. By the time practice was over, <laughs> even Magic had to acknowledge basketball's landscape had been changed forever. Good job, Steve. Larry and I were talking, and Michael walks in, and he says, it's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> <laughs> and we both hit each other like, well, he's not lying. <laughs> Monte Carlo was kind of a turning. All right, y'all. So uh, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and conclude the video here. Please watch it in. Um, Man, great documentary. I appreciate y'all for recommending this. Um, it's funny that I've seen that portion before, man, but I've never seen the entire documentary. It's crazy, man. So, um, but hey, keep on liking, keep on commenting. I tried to take it easy with the horn today. I know y'all been commenting, hey, man, please reduce the horn, all that stuff. It's a part of what I do. It's a part of who I am. But hey, I'm going I'm I'm to try my best to compromise like I've stated earlier in the video takes a real man to compromise so let me try it out see how it does see if my flow still works but um check out one of these other videos they fire the production quality i think it's just gonna go up from here i enjoy doing this and let's go ahead and try to wrap the series up tomorrow but anyway love you peace